All right, high rollers, it's not often you put out an interview request to a Hall of Famer and minutes later you're chatting with him. What a treat today. This guy's a professional gambler, a blackjack aficionado, one of the best card counters on the planet, appeared on season one of the World Series of Blackjack, host of the popular podcast Gambling with an Edge. He's talked to all of the greats and he's written about it too. His book, Gambling Wizards is a must-have for any wannabe advantage player or gambling junkie in general. Richard W. Munchkin, our guest today. Richard, welcome to the show, man. Thanks for joining us. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm happy to do it. You can no longer play blackjack at the Barona Casino in San Diego. Is that right? <laughs> uh, that is true. You know, the Barona Casino did what I think is one of the smartest things they could have done, which is they host or sponsor a, a party every year called the Blackjack Ball, which just happened a few weeks ago. And part of the agreement at the Blackjack Ball is that the people who attend, which are the best blackjack players in the world, agree not to play at Barona Casino. <laughs> in addition to that, they sponsor the Blackjack Hall of Fame, and the people who are in the Blackjack Hall of Fame get full RFB at the Verona. I can go there anytime, stay for free, play golf for free, eat for free, but not play. So they basically comp us not to play. <laughs> I think it saved them probably millions of dollars over the years. Really? You think that's true? Millions? Oh, yeah. Between all the players that have agreed not to play there, yeah, I think it's millions. I mean, card counters, the true pros, they're just so good. They're going to win in the long run, correct? Well, yeah, they're going to win in the long run, and the vast majority of them have learned other ways to beat the casinos that are much more powerful than card counting. So, you know, card counting is the smallest edge against the casino and the easiest for the casino to detect and the most amount of heat. And as you get into more advanced forms of beating casinos the edges get bigger and it's harder for them to detect. So, yeah, there's no doubt in my mind that, that the figure is millions that, that it saved them. When you say bigger edges and find things to take advantage of, are you talking about the deals they make before coming to play? For instance, you get insurance on certain losses, you get certain comps, all those things? Well, that would be one aspect. You know, that's kind of a famous case of Don Johnson uh, was voted into the Blackjack Hall of Fame this year, won $15 million in Atlantic City, taking advantage of loss rebates, among other things. But that's just one move, I would say. And one of the things I'm really proud of on our show is that we have had guests on talking about how to beat, I think, every single game in the casino – how to beat it legally, and how to do it with a mathematical advantage. I mean, there's no BS about, you know, finding streaks or any of that kind of crap. I'm talking about hard math, every game, slot machines, lottery tickets. I mean, every possible game we have had people on talking about how they can be beat legally and and mathematically. I like to use the word true gambler, and I don't throw it around loosely. When I say true gambler, I mean a guy like you and your cohorts who are constantly working to find edges because, let's face it, there's a lot of money at stake, and when money comes into play, there are always, look at poker, there are always people trying to find ways to beat the game. Yeah, yeah, and that is what professionals do. They constantly try to find new ways to beat the game. You know, for 30 years I've said that learning how to count cards is easy. Learning how to get away with it is what's hard. <laughs> and, and the professionals, as I say, many of them have moved on from card counting because there are so many better options. But really, more than half the battle is figuring out the best way to take the money out of the casino without the casino figuring out that you're a professional. I want to talk about the podcast and your book in a second, but first, I understand you started playing chess and Jim Rummy at a very young age, and at the age of 12, you found out, uh, perhaps a life-changing moment, that you could play backgammon and win money at it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's true. I, um, My father and my grandmother taught me to play Jim Rummy and chess when I was three, and I just loved playing games as a kid. And I grew up in Chicago where the winters were very harsh, so people stayed indoors in the winter and played a lot of games. But yeah, I discovered backgammon when I was about 12 and 
my father had a very wealthy friend who had a son that was my age. And he told me that he was playing backgammon with his father for money. And I thought, oh, my God, you know, if this idiot will play this game, <laughs> you know, uh, this has got to be worth money to me. And I, I had learned how to play backgammon, but I was a novice, but I immediately went to the library and took out whatever books they had on backgammon and started studying and, and really learning to play better. And I never did get to play the wealthy guy, <laughs> but it did lead me kind of on a path of, of backgammon, which I played at a very high level, you know, through college and for a few years after college. Uh, and then I sort of grew tired of the game. There wasn't enough money in it really for me because I had started playing blackjack. Is it this simple? You're good at these games because you're good at math? No, not at all. And and I say I would say math has very little to do with it. I think I was good at these games because I had a passion for them and I was willing to work and really try to get better at them. And I, I think that's the secret to anything. You know, I tell my kids your success in life is going to be based on, on how hard you work. And in order to work really hard, I think you have to find a passion. One thing that jumped out at me when I was reading up on you is that you worked in the 70s at a place called The Castaways. And the reason that jumped out at me is because I remember writing a little feature report on Sonny Reisner, Reisner, yes, the Sonny legendary Reisner. bookie, right? Uh, he's the guy who put out odds on who shot JR. I mean, that must have been quite a place. I actually was working there when that happened. There was a tiny sports book that was just a window. It looked like a pickup window at a pizza place, and it was called the Hole in the Wall Sports Book. And, yeah, he put out odds on who shot JR, which for the younger people was a very popular television show called Dallas, and the cliffhanger at the end of one season was the lead JR got shot, but you didn't see who shot him. And, yeah, he put out odds on, on who, who had shot him. But the gaming control board came in and shut that down. It turned out that you were not allowed to book action on non-sporting events. <laughs> at least at that time. That may have changed by now. But he certainly made international headlines for that little hole in the wall. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was it like in Vegas when you started card counting and, and really making your run at this business of professional gambling back in the day? Well, it was exactly the time portrayed in the movie Casino. Really? Um, it was great for counting cards because they had brought in multiple deck games, either four decks or six, and many, many bosses said things to me like, oh, well, nobody can count a shoe, right? So they were very protective of the single deck games and the double deck games, but not protective at all of the shoe games. So really, you could run around and for card counters, one of the, the two things that are really important are how big is your spread, and that is the difference between your smallest bet and your biggest bet, and how many of the cards they were dealing. And, you know, back then they would deal three and a half decks out of four or five and a half decks out of six. You know, nowadays a card counter, his teeth would fall out if he saw a game like that. And, you know, we would commonly spread when I very first started from five dollars to two hands of 200 and on a shoe game nobody cared because they as i say they believed that people couldn't count a you know shoe game the podcast gambling with an edge i mean you've had so many great guests on and i see you just had ed thorpe on the legendary author of beat the dealer another blackjack hall of famer the guy who really made everything possible correct oh yeah and i mean t just a personal hero of mine so that was really a thrill to have him on the show i i just uh i'm so uh, honored that he came on and proud and as i say i mean th this guy's just a beast i mean he has a new book out you know he made I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars with his hedge fund. Just an incredibly smart guy and really, you know, top gambler. It must uh, have been a big thrill for you. A hero, he's on your podcast and you're talking about your passion. Yep, absolutely. I mean, there are very few people on a list that, I mean, of, of the people that I would desperately want to be on the show, he was in the top five. You know, there are a few other people who just are not willing to come on the show that, that are you know, some of the best gamblers in the world, and I understand they value their anonymity, 
but yeah, it was a real thrill to get him on. Important to note, they won't come on the show because they're still crushing the casinos, right? Yeah, well, actually, the, the biggest gamblers in the world are actually the guys who bet on horse racing. Really? And, oh, yeah, yeah, it, even more so than, than uh, sports betting. I mean, there's just a finite amount you can take out of, out of a casino just because the amount they have to lose. Whereas uh, horse racing, you know, I mean, the top guys are, are taking down $100 million a year at a horse racing. Wow, that's so, unbelievable. Yeah. See, I didn't know that. I did not know that at all. I'm going to have to look into horse racing and try to get some guys on to talk about it. You know, you were talking about the blackjack ball at the Barona. Is there a blackjack ball in Vegas that's highly secretive as well? No, no. The blackjack ball is in Las Vegas, but Barona is a sponsor of the ball. Oh, I got you. Okay, so it is in Vegas. But this thing's highly secretive. The other thing you mentioned there with Ed Thorpe is about the hedge fund. Important to note that a lot of these guys that make it to the Hall of Fame that get invited, you have to be invited to this blackjack ball. They're pretty smart dudes and, and gals, right? They've got top jobs. They're very successful in other areas. Oh, yeah. For example, uh, one of the guys, he wasn't there this year, but he's been coming for the last few years, is a guy named Blair Ho, who after Blackjack, he went into options trading, and uh, he sold his company a number of years ago to Goldman Sachs for $600 million, and then decided to get into politics and, and ran for Senate in Illinois and got beat by an upstart Barack Obama. So, yeah, I mean, there there are some incredibly talented people that and, and wealthy people that got their starts in blackjack and moved on to other, what I would call forms of gambling. I mean, the, the stock market is really just the biggest casino in the world, and they were able to take what they had learned there and apply it to other things, be it the market or horse racing or sports betting or, or whatever. Well, there's a lot of information, and you got to check out the podcast. It's at gamblingwithanedge.com, and you've talked to some great people there, right, Richard? Yeah, put the show up every Thursday. In addition to the show, we have several people who blog at the site about different things, video poker, regular poker, daily fantasy sports. So, yeah, there's a lot of uh, gambling information going on at the site. Absolutely. Gamblingwithanedge.com. I know you've talked to all the greats. And it kind of leads into your book, Gambling Wizards, Conversations with the World's Greatest Gamblers. I know you've spoken to Doyle Brunson. Did you also get a chance to speak with uh, the sports better, the legend Billy Walters? Yeah, he's one of the chapters in the book. Um, Chip Reese is also one of the chapters in the book. The book is, a co is eight interviews with eight of the top professional gamblers in the world, and I wanted to cover a lot of different aspects. So Billy Walters is in there talking about sports betting as is Stan Thompson. Uh, Stan Thompson was one of the owners of Pinnacle Sports, which for your sports betting people, they will know, you know, that is the best uh, sports betting site in the world. Uh, he no longer is an owner. Now, in that interview, he's not talking about Pinnacle. He was talking about being a sports better. As I say, Doyle and Chip are in there talking about poker. Uh, Tommy Highlands is uh, talking about blackjack. So anyway, as I say, there are eight interviews, different aspects of gambling. If your listeners are interested in gambling, I think they'll find it a really interesting book. Mainly, I wrote a book that was the kind of book that I would want to pick up and read. Absolutely. That's the way to do it. And it must be fun for you, too, because you're a top gambler. You get to pick the brains of other top gamblers. I'm just wondering, what do you think are some of the similar traits that all these people possess? Um, a disdain for authority, I think, is one. You know, they're all people who don't want to be told what to do, so they wouldn't really fit into the 9-to-5 world. You know, I, I think that's the main one. And lastly, I've always wanted to ask you this, because I, I was surprised to learn, I, I remember watching the, the series, the World Series of Blackjack on the Game Show Network. I always wanted to ask one of the players in that show what they thought of the format you know, player versus player, and also the fact that, you know, the organizers tried to bring out the personalities of the game. Your thoughts on that? You know, um, <laughs> it's one of the things I regret, actually, having done that show. Over the course of the last 35 years, I have retired from Blackjack, oh, maybe three or four times. And so uh, when people <laughs> asked me to do the show, I agreed to go on. Because I thought, you know, I'm not really playing in casinos anymore, so I don't really care. 
you know, but then I end up going back and playing some more. So, yeah, I, I, I really kind of regret having done it. Because now you are recognizable. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it did cause me some problems when I started playing after that started airing. But, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I, Blackjack to me is just not a very interesting thing to watch on television. Of course, I would have said the same thing about poker before they came up with the whole card cam. Right. But they didn't come up with anything for Blackjack that really makes it more interesting. You know, they tried again a few years later with uh, UBT, the Ultimate Blackjack Tour. Um, yeah, I, I just I just don't think it really works. The podcast is Gambling with an Edge. The book is Gambling Wizards. Our guest today, Richard W. Munchkin. It's been a real thrill. A blackjack card counter, a member of the Hall of Fame. He's at RWM21 on Twitter. And the website, you got to check it out, gamblingwithanedge.com. Richard, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Absolutely. I'm happy to do it.